forward. Susan Dudley, who's at McMaster now, also did her master's. And that, again, helped me get started. But I wasn't bored. I was really enjoying the work on lichens. And I needed the money of the acid rain grants and things that were associated with the lichen studies. But I wanted to do other things as well. And I was looking for opportunities to recruit more students. Lichens weren't very sexy. I wasn't getting a lot of letters uh, about wanting to study grad, grad work. And uh, Yves Maffet was finishing undergraduate work uh, and was looking for masters and going around the city uh, talking to people. And Gypsy Moth had arrived the same year I did. And in 77, forests all around Montreal were defoliated completely by this European invader. And obviously money became available to study that. I put up my hand. I didn't know anything about trees, even less about insects. It didn't seem to matter. They were desperate <laughs> to give the government money to somebody. And it came with a government scientist attached, Luc Jobin, who spoke this crystal clear clerical French that I could even understand. <laughs> And he would take me all around to different sites and teach me about things that he knew, which was a lot. And it really got off to a good start. Good papers. Uh, Eve was a wonderful organizer, as he continues to be. And uh, really was a very, very productive lab at that point in time. I got tenure. I got my first sabbatical. And I had a lot of data. And I had a year at Cornell when Marcia started her PhD to uh, really reflect on the analyses and what was going to come out of them. Uh, I wrote a paper in the American Naturalist in 1984. I wrote it during that sabbatical year. At that time, things got published years later, because you had to typeset them and send things by mail instead of by internet. Uh, that paper, though, came out of having time to think, really think, not have to teach. Sabbaticals are really wonderful, and if you use them to full efficacy, they can really lead to good things. Part of what I've done is just, uh, again, this learning on your own. In the gypsy moth work, we had to decide if they were feeding preferentially. The caterpillars ate all kinds of trees, some more, some less, and we wanted an index to quantify that, and there were uh, seven indices in the literature. That's literature you found in the basement of the library. You went and you looked and read and it was very different. And you figured out how all the math worked and you published the paper because you you spent the month figuring it out so you wrote it up. And it surprises me that sort of paper keeps getting cited. It's my second most cited paper. It's not earth shaking, it's just useful even in this day and age, 2014, 15, 16, with the internet, people still don't understand electivity indices. More recently, that same paper, uh, Suzanne Renner, who I've never met, sent me an email last month and said, here's a draft of a paper I'm writing uh, about your paper for the American Naturalist. It's the 150th anniversary of the society next year. And they've got these uh, papers from the past that they're highlighting. And she wrote a paper about my paper. And I thought, well, that's nice. And she said nice things about me. She's very gracious. And, but she ended with what I put in bold. I'm not so sure about the daring. But hypotheses such as those put forward by Lekowitz, supported by limited data and statistics, this is a compliment that's cutting both ways. <laughs> you may have a harder time getting published in the journal today. But I'm going to circle back to that if we ever get to the end of these comments, because that's a real touchstone for how science has changed. At that time, in a sabbatic, you could think, you could take the time to write, you could publish your thoughts with a modest amount of data, and put out hypotheses that you thought were of interest and worth testing. And even if you didn't test them, people like Suzanne, 20 years later, would pick them up and publish in ecology letters and nature and do all the things I might have done if I'd stuck with 
that particular hypothesis. So sometimes things unfold from your work more than you think they might. You come back from that first sabbatic and you realize, okay, I've got tenure, but I don't want to become dead wood, and I really want to build on what I've learned during that year of reading and thinking. And there's been a lot of reading and thinking already going on. I want to make that point. Arriving in 76 was a very special time. Don Kramer had come in 1975, Rob Peters as well. Uh, Graham and I arrived, Graham Bell and I arrived in 76. Louis Lefebvre a year or two later, Dan Schoen not long after. And we were in the habit of meeting every week at someone's home after dinner for drinks and discussion. That's kind of the, along with older people that were here, Doc Kauf, Bill Leggett, Frank Riddler sometimes. Uh, good, good discussions, critical discussions. Rob, for those of you who knew him, he died too young uh, of cancer. For those of you who knew him, uh, didn't believe in evolution and was not very happy with the way ecology was being done. And during his postdoc in Italy, just before he came to McGill, he'd written a paper in 1976 that was basically a prelude to his later book, A Critique for Ecology. And he started empirical ecology and had a whole different perspective. So we would argue about ecology and evolutionary, ecological and evolutionary perspectives. And natural selection was tautological or wasn't. I didn't actually know much about ecology of that sort and even less about evolution. But just being in those discussions was like being on an elevator going up top speed. Graham Bell having come from Oxford, Rob countering every point, little Oxonian debates <laughs> happening, I'm listening taking notes, <laughs> learning all these things, going reading papers they were referring to. It was really a, an amazing time uh, to, to be here. And so when I came back, I built on that because I tried to address Rob's critiques. I worked with annual plants coming from the ag literature where there were components of fitness studies. How do traits contribute to survival and reproduction? And I had systems with cockleburr, which is an important weed, and uh, also later with impatience, uh, touch me not at Mont Saint Hilaire. And also, at that time, I was attracting uh, grad students and postdocs. And I, like Mike Adams, who let me do what I wanted to, I encouraged them to do what they could do with the resources I had available. And they taught me things. Ann Lubbers with her PhD from Duke, Mike Ferris with his PhD from Michigan. Uh, they taught me things, and I, I learned with them. And that's the beauty of these uh, mid-career interactions. And it really helped because uh, Luantin, Gould and Luantin's article, also critical of shallow adapt adaptationist thinking, was much in discussion and sharpen the need, I think, to take data looking at how fitness actually played out. Things got really good in 1984, and the thing in red is very true. Sometimes, occasionally, very occasionally, the government get things, gets things right. Uh, FCAR, which is the prelude to FQRMT, created team grants. And that just changed the way we did science in Quebec. And to this day, that grant program is copied all over the world and in various forms uh, is available to people. And thank God the team grants have been, been reinstituted. Graham and Dan and I, Marsha was off doing her PhD, wrote in that first competition uh, an idea of using the two impatient species at St. Hilaire as annual plants in the native forest environment to look at the ecology and genetics and evolutionary uh, relationships between these sister species as they played out in the uh, situation. I just looked at my watch and I realized I'm going to speed up. <laughs> uh, and I will do that. I, I don't want to run over time. I want to be able to have time to visit with everybody. Mid-career is also, early mid-career is when, if you see an opportunity, go for it. Uh, 
I've been denied the use of good growth facilities to do controlled experiments. I needed them. Uh, NSERC created this uh, program called a Major Installation Award. I convinced 10 of my colleagues to go in on the grant. We got it. It was amazing. It's the biggest grant McGill had ever gotten at that time, <coughs> bigger even than in medicine. And we had two and a half million dollars to build the fighter train, which we did. And that brought more people and better quality work and gave us a lot of opportunity. Second lesson is if you get something big, like Andy Gonzalez's LEAP program now, or anything of that sort, uh, Christian Messier will certainly second this sentiment. Once you have a, a good play and you've done well, you're going to get other opportunities automatically. This one, Tibet never did again. It's very strange. You know how they subsidize films? They, they make a bundle of films, Tibet films, that are going to be allowed to get tax credits if investors invest in them. It's like a guaranteed investment certificate for a very high interest rate. And they take all that money, and as long as two of the 25 films are a commercial success, the investors don't have to pay back their, pay tax on their income. So I got a call from the VP Research, and he said, this is about to happen. We've got one day to put together 25 two-page proposals in the university, bundle them together. We'll call them Martin X. Would you like to be part of that? I said, what? <laughs> and then I said, sure. And then I wrote a two-pager with Dan uh, and Greg Brown as part of it, and with Katrina Bogban and I as another part. And they got bundled together with things by Howard Bussey and others that had greater commercial potential. And we got another two and a half million dollars. It was wonderful. <laughs> they never did it again. They lost money on it. <laughs> Anyhow, the other aphorisms there, uh, and I'm looking at, at Frank and Mark and Claire, and uh, I really, uh, it's important if you get a big facility like that to make sure you get good people that can keep it going. And that's not easy, and fortunately for the Phytotron and others who've used it, we've had that good fortune. That same era, 1993, we were still having those discussion groups, but now with grad students. We're still early internet. You still had to go to the library to get data, or write to friends and beg for data records. But we had a one semester discussion group with this list of students, Graham and I leading it, wrote up the discussions as a paper, and it's still cited to this day uh, quite steadily. Why didn't we keep doing that? Uh, because we're at a major pivot. About 1990, uh, things really changed. So if you go back to the top, I started in 76. I bought my first computer, which is this beauty at the bottom, the <laughs> Southwest Technical Products computer. I had to program it in hexadecimal, which I had to learn on my own. And, and the printer was a grocery store printer, 40 columns across, that you got your output on. Put your heads around that. Those of you that are used to laptops that are more powerful than the mainframe computer where I went to grad school, things have changed a lot. And early on, ARPANET was the pre-internet. And it was in 1990 that they finally decommissioned ARPANET and the World Wide Web was created. And that was a tremendously good thing, but also it had a downside. Because time became compressed. Everything moved faster. You no longer had as much time to think as you had previously. You didn't have to send manuscripts in the mail. They all went by email. Everything shifted dramatically and then progressed into social networking and things that changed the way we're doing science. I just kept doing science. <coughs> Biggest career, mid-career challenge is how to hold everything together. You're now recruiting more students and postdocs than you can take because you can't afford to support them all. Uh, you've got to make choices. You've got to struggle to keep up with what they're doing, because they're doing things that you don't necessarily know how to do. It's an important uh, turning point in any academic career. 
And it's also a time of wonderful opportunity. It's also the time, at least in the 80s and early 90s, when you could finally begin to afford to go to international conferences. I went to Intercol in 87 and met Kichiro Kitazawa, two young scientists. His English wasn't very good, but we bonded. And six years later, he invited me to Japan. He'd risen to a point where he could fund my being in Japan. And Marcia and I went there. And I've been back now 12 times. I've published a book with him. And don't miss the opportunities to do international science. They're much more abundant now, but they bring you uh, so many good things, not just with your collaborator, your foreign colleague, but with all the students and people that move back and forth through that channel and really enrich both sides of the collaboration. Basically, mid-career, I made a decision to stay on the functional ecology of trees. That's what we now call what used to be physiological ecology. It's still the same basic problem. How do the different parts of a plant, whether it's a tree or an annual herb, interact with one another? How do they vary in an evolutionary perspective across species and a genus or across families? And how does that relate to the uh, performance of plants in a community, in a given environment. And that whole field has exploded and has become very, very rich and very rewarding, and I've been fortunate to, to have a hand in all that. So that's the wave I chose to ride. I think, by analogy, you might think that you end up, if you think of it as a surfing analogy, you end up somewhere because of happenstance, doing a master's and a PhD, you're kind of in a place. And you could have been in any one of them, any number of places. As an undergrad, where do I go to grad school? You know, you're trying to balance two careers, a partner, you're trying to be in a city or in a town. You make that choice and then you're kind of wedded to it. But you keep getting all these opportunities and if you choose the right ones and are lucky, it just gets better and better. And I've been lucky in that way. It's not that I made terribly thoughtful choices in every case. A lot of it was just good luck, chance. The functional ecology of trees, uh, and I'm looking now at uh, people in the audience from Ukam. Uh, in, the, in the period when uh, Christian Messier just was finishing his degree at UBC in forestry, He's a bona fide forester. And he came back to UCOM and started a forest ecology, not alone, but with others. They coalesced as a forest ecology program. And I was doing forest ecology and didn't have colleagues really, uh, as many as I needed to really have a critical mass. And also there were opportunities at UDAM and at Concordia and Griffey, a group of forest ecologists interuniversitaire took form and really changed the way we all train our grad students and our postdocs and our ability to do that research and to move it into the public arena. Because we were able to wrest the control from Laval, where forestry was seen as a profession and professional foresters knew how to manage a forest and interject into that discussion an ecological and conservation viewpoint. That wouldn't have happened without the center, without the initiative of colleagues. And so for me, strategic, to serve my own need, to train people, and to carry on my research, but also to broaden the impact of, of the research. And it just went on that way. We went from graffiti to Ceph. We wrote a CREATE grant for training. Uh, had very successful results from that. And of course, QCBS, same kind of center, FQRT funded. This really makes Quebec a very, very good place to do science. There's not many places we can get that kind of networking support. Sometimes you rescue people. Ken Ari came over from Japan. He knew about my work. He knew about the Japanese connection. 
he wanted to test uh, Tillman's R star theory. There's a classic problem in forest ecology. Jacques Brousseau and I have both been interested in it. Uh, beech maple codominance. There's 11 beech species in the world, 150 some maple species. The only place in all of the world where beech and maple form a codominant forest is in eastern North America. And plant ecologists have puzzled about this for a long time. And Ken thought that by using Tillman's theoretical construct, he could look at how nutrient limitations in the seedling stage mediated the codominance relationship in the forest of Los Angeles. 1997, lots of energy and ambition. He laid out these wonderful permanent plots. He wrote a great PhD proposal, defended it. January 1998, we were at the, I guess it was Griffey at that point, and uh, Jardin Botanique, and I had to walk home through the freezing rain, and things were pretty bad. 1998, the ice storm. Uh, 20 years of timber came down, 20 years of productivity at Mont Saint Hilaire was on the ground. Ken's PhD thesis plans were out the window. So what do you do? You study the ice storm and recovery from the ice storm. What could be more logical? <laughs> <laughs> he pivoted very well. I give him a lot of credit for that. He's got that sort of Zen cultural background. And he, he, he wrote a great PhD thesis, recruited a master's student, Mike Cooper, who's now a prof at Harvard. And with people in the lab, with the two of them, we did a lot of good work at that time on the recovery from the ice storm. And then we started doing a lot of other forest disturbance work because Mount St. Hilaire and every other forest around Montreal was getting more and more disturbed. The suburbs were sprawling out. Uh, we now have do got documentation of that from Joachim Jaeger and geography at Concordia. We can see how the city was just exploding and swallowing up what were reasonably undisturbed forests. And forest disturbance became part of my research agenda. And along with that was community ecology, as Gregor alluded to, niche theory, neutral theory, Steve Hubble's book, Graham's paper, in American Naturalist, lots of good discussion. Uh, I was blessed with two really good students, uh, Justine Karsten and Ben Gilbert, uh, who embraced these problems and wrote really good master's theses and then went on and did even better PhDs elsewhere and are still uh, both uh, good colleagues. The FQRNT team grants had kept going. We had cycles of three, four, five years, different people involved. Once Marcia got her PhD and came back to the McGill community with her job as director of the herbarium out of McDonald campus, uh, we, we actually wrote grants together, we taught together. I still marvel at the fact we managed that for as many years as we did. I wouldn't recommend it for every marriage. <laughs> there are times when different styles conflict. Uh, but in any case, for research, uh, we worked together on big problems, the one that Gregor alluded to, that are classic problems. How can so many closely related species coexist? at very small spatial scales. It's one thing in the tropics, that's where the ideas were first brought up. But in Mont St. Hilaire, 10 square kilometers, 60 species of carex, how can that be? Obviously the systematists are splitters, but Marcia tells me, no, no, they're all good species, and they're different. They showed different ecologies. And we gradually worked our way through that. Uh, Graham and Marcia and I, with the help of Mark Valland, and other students over the years, and now with the leverage of uh, molecular systematics, giving us, with Marsha's NSF grant and her colleagues globally, a global phylogeny for carrots that we can map traits and performance onto and analyze community assembly uh, with Jonathan Davies and others like that from a molecular uh, systematic point of view. I'd be remiss if I didn't go on for two or three more minutes. The other international collaborations are in China, a country that 
was closed to us for a very long time. But when it opened up, they sent, in the first uh, years that they opened up at all, they sent some people abroad on visiting as visiting scholars for one year. And good luck. I mean, I was so lucky to have Jin Young Fang in my lab for one year. He went back. He got a job at Peking University, so top university. He became the youngest member of the Academy of Sciences. He became the head of the Institute of Botany. He became responsible for the carbon balance of all of China. Now, whenever Marsha and I go to China, we just get anything we want. <laughs> I mean, and he sends me wonderful people that have great data, and we have fun. Kachan Manu, the first Tibetan really to rise high in the Chinese system, has been with me the last year or two, uh, just teaching me new statistical methods, and it's just fun. Science should be fun, or we shouldn't be doing it. And I've been lucky because it's been a lot of fun. And I'll end with the Montevigie connection. Having been director at Galt for 16 years, watching the city spread out, watching the uh, things that had happened in Chicago where I grew up, this urban sprawl <coughs> issue really weighed on me. And I had a responsibility to protect for future generations Mont Saint-Hilaire, the reserve. And I began to work on that. And I began to recruit in our department and others colleagues who could work with me in that way. And uh, Elena Bennett and Andy Gonzalez, uh, Janine Ramtula, Jeff Cardell, we were able to get three grants simultaneously and build the Monterigie connection to look at questions of reconnecting the Monterigian hills through forest corridors. And I'm looking around and many of you in the audience have been involved in that. And then when I thought I was going to retire, Marsha also thought we were going to retire. Uh, they offered me the Liberero chair, which came with money, no strings attached, do more of what you want to do. So I stayed a few more years. <laughs> and I didn't, I stopped taking students because I don't think it's fair for an older professor. You should make room for younger colleagues. And you don't want to take a PhD student when you're going to orphan them by retiring. I'd stopped taking students. But I recruited Anna and Kyle, uh, who were hanging around and looking for opportunities. And I was looking for good people. And it was really fun. It's been really fun. This project is just wrapping up this week. Uh, we're reporting to the town of St. Lazar a global synthesis of the ecological value of the landscape in the town and a management plan associated with it that's linked to their urban planning in ways that uh, I think are transportable to other communities in the CMM, in the metropolitan community. So we'll push that political agenda through the town of St. Hilaire. I'll come back and forth from BC occasionally to deal with that. And at the same time, uh, Andy and Elena, and Christian Messier, Jerome Dubois, others are working on related problems. And I think it's going to end up uh, being really good for conservation in our region. So I'm going to end with this slide because I've got one concern I want to voice. There's a movement out there, some of you will know it, called Slow Science. And it's got to do with that pivot in early 1990s, the compression of time. And the kind of time I had to think in 1980s when I was on sabbatic, or on any sabbatic, as you now go through your career, you're getting sabbatics every seventh year, almost biblically. And that's fine, because you can think. But I'm worried about what's going to happen to the students we're training, the undergrads, the grads, the postdocs. How, when things are moving as quickly as they are, how do the so-called stars in the system, the established people that are uh, magnets for money and opportunity, how do we avoid becoming like so many medical labs are, where you're just a cog in the wheel? I'm sure you've all heard the stories of one lab right here at McGill in medicine, taking in two or three postdocs at a time, giving them the same project, and saying, whichever one of you publishes the paper first, you get the letter of recommendation. The other two of you can go to hell. 
that shouldn't happen. It does happen. And I think in ecology, we've got to deal with that challenge. How do we bring people up so that they find uh, in this situation their own vision and forge their own identity and then go out and become stars in their own way? I think that's something to really think hard about. Because that's the big, biggest change I see from the time I was at that stage to now. So I leave you with that thought. I thank you for your patience. I'm sorry I ran over. Have an extra wine on me. <laughs> thank you.